Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Agri-Food Conversations brought to you by iSelect Fund, the Van Trump Report, and the 11 Institute, and Family Farms Group. My name is David Yogam. I'm a principal here in the iSelect Fund Ventures team. I'm excited to welcome you to our discussion today. Um, Agri-Food Conversations is all about driving innovation in food and agriculture, and each month we highlight a specific theme, this month's theme being precision fermentation. On today's call, we're joined by Russ Heisner, founder of Bruco. Bruco is a new venture that leverages precision fermentation and biotechnology to create ingredient and process solutions for the alcoholic beverages industry. Now, each of you knows uh, that companies are more likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. And we've invited you to this call because you're some of the smartest, most talented people in Bruco's market. You're potential customers for Bruco's products and services. You have built a company similar to Bruco's or uh, you have unique expertise and understand the challenges and opportunities that Bruco may face. Now, a few process comments uh, before we start. Um, we are not soliciting investment. This presentation is to provide information to help Bruco find customers, mentors, and other strategic relationships that can help them grow their business. You can ask the Q&A box to ask a question at any time, and we will answer as many questions as time allows at the end of the presentation. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for replay. So without further delay, I am pleased to introduce Russ Heisner, founder of Bruco. Russ, we're all eyes on yours. All right. Thank you very much. Nice to meet everybody. Thank you for uh, your time today. A um, little bit of background. Um, I am a uh, UC Davis graduate uh, from the from the 80s. I, I focus. Uh, I had a degree in fermentation sciences, and I had spent my 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 career um, really uh, in the beverage ethanol industry. First as a, a one of the founders of the Harpoon Brewery in Boston, um, then building many many breweries in the 90s for other. Uh, craft beer enthusiasts, and then found myself with another startup in the early 2000s that was focused on developing a cellulosic biofuels technology. And that was uh, a, my first foray into uh, industrial um, biotechnology. Um, around 2015, I got back to my roots, started another small brewery. So it was really my third company that I had uh, uh, some, some hand in, in founding. And then uh, turned around and started talking to a company called uh, Ginkgo Bioworks um, in uh, 2016. Um, Ginkgo Bioworks, uh, if, you, if folks aren't familiar with it, is what, what the leading uh, synthetic biology platform um, probably in the world at this point. Um, it was founded in 2008. Uh, we've been growing like crazy. Um, synthetic biology, I'll talk a little bit more about synthetic biology in, in, in the context of precision fermentation, but with, with, in its relationship to uh, what we're trying to get done with Bruco, um, Ginkgo would be our outsourced R&D provider. I also wanted to introduce a company called Ferment. Ferment um, is a new uh, incubation arm uh, that was probably has its roots in Ginkgo as well. Um, it is uh, prior to last year, um, the, the folks who were driving uh, spin-outs and, and, and new operational companies uh, from Ginkgo were doing it within the Ginkgo framework. And last year, we decided to formalize it. Um, there has been uh, seven uh, new opcos launched um, within, uh, within sort of the Ginkgo uh, ecosystem uh, to date. Uh, Bruco will be number eight. So without further ado, um, took it to heart. I thought it would be good to get a little bit into like the roots of precision fermentation and um, really brewing uh, and bread making is what we call the uh, OG of precision fermentation. Precision fermentation is, is really introducing sugar starch to a yeast or, or, a, or a small microbe, make specific molecules um, either for uh, food and beverage or for functional benefit. Um, and so it really has its roots of almost as old as civilization, in five, you know, going back 5,000 years, uh, probably, probably even earlier than that, but those are the first records of it. Um, you, you flash forward a bit, in the 20th century, there is a chemical synthesis revolution that really happened um, primarily around, think about plastics, uh, petrochemicals and plastics and driving chemical synthesis and also there was a lot of moves into the pharma world where there was purification of the botanically extracted molecules and then um, chemical synthesis roots to purifying those molecules. 
modern day precision fermentation takes advantage of, of the fact that uh, biotechnology with its, both its tools and our learnings and the ability to edit uh, genomes uh, very in a very precise way um, actually is probably the next revolution that's gonna happen and very specifically um, we put in the context of small molecules, enzymes, uh, functional proteins, and, um, and or the organism itself um, when we're talking about modern day fermentation. Moving into Bruco, um, you know, while uh, brewing and, and bread making uh, are probably one of the original examples, it's actually of of precision fermentation, brewing is actually one of those one of those industries that hasn't kept pace and evolved as uh, as fast uh, and adopted technology as fast as other sectors, specifically food and beverage. So what we're seeing now is with uh, things going on and uh, climate change and inputs and scarcity of inputs and energy rising, et cetera, there's continued pressure for producers to, you know, get more innovative, uh, continue to deliver, you know, high quality uh, alcoholic beverages. And at the same time, there is a rising consumer segment that is more demanding, more critical, and being absolutely uh, cynical about um, transparency in the way uh, that they're demanding, you know, their alcoholic beverages and food and beverage to, in, uh, in, uh, in general. So what Bruco is trying to do is bridge that gap. We want to address um, rising consumer expectations, um, provide real data and transparency and new technology, um, then link that back to absolute producer benefit. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in the next few slides. A little bit about the evolution, I sort of hinted about it. You know, major consumer industries over um, over the last you know 10, 10 years or so have been uh, reacting consumer demand around sustainability. Um, we've seen it in automobiles, uh, electric vehicles. You know, when they got started, were a little bit of a sideline, but now it's a three and a half trillion dollar industry. Um, the food the food industry has you know reacted next. Um, Alcohol tends to follow food and beverage and consumer, consumer, uh, uh, I guess, focus um, over the years, um, but it's still a very large market. And we're fully expecting the alcoholic beverage industry to start adopting these technologies and start you know, meeting the challenge of, of rising consumer demands. So when I, um, I'm actually a, um, a Ginkgo employee, I'm gonna be, I, have, I, have I wear a, a dual hat as entrepreneur resident for Bruco. Um, I'm also on their, uh, on their uh, commercial development team. Uh, but when I joined the company, I was tasked with writing a business plan. And we, while we're acknowledging that there is a lot of potential to address uh, you know, the entire supply chain from raw material inputs and process and then downstream into distribution and, and then into the retail and consumer segment. Our first four way of the way we want to stand up the company is really going to be focused on process and producer um, economics, um, linking those to consumer benefit. We have three major platform technologies that we're moving the company forward with. Um, we have platform one, which we refer to as our production biology platform. This is where um, we are going to be using uh, precision fermentation, uh, new, new, new molecules or novel molecules, novel yeasts in combination to create new processes. And the first, uh, the first prototype and program that we're gonna be running through is actually valorizing spent grains. Spent grains in, <clears throat> in the brewing and distilling industry is a waste stream. After uh, the starch is extracted, converted to sugar, and then turned into uh, alcohol during fermentation, there's the husk material that's left over, there's protein in it, um, the fiber of the husks itself is a form of sugar, 
And if you present, if we can convert that fiber into uh, fermentable sugar um, it, and feed it to a yeast, we can actually make more beverage ethanol. And that's the concept there. In platform two, um, we refer to as our functional biomolecules um, platform. This is actually the one that most closely adheres to uh, precision fermentation. In this one, um, we are going to be focusing uh, in our early uh, stage of uh, development on taking rare hop molecules. Um, hops are used in brewing uh, to provide flavor and um, to the extent that the, some of these molecules that provide some uh, preservative effect um, you know, are added to uh, the beer for flavor, fragrance, and the shell stability. What we're going to do is use a yeast, and we're actually going to ferment uh, two types of molecules uh, that have uh, strong antimicrobial anti property, anti antioxidant property, and we're going to demonstrate uh, with some products that uh, we may even be able to replace um, tunnel pasteurization uh, with simply adding precision fermented uh, hot molecules uh, to increase shell stability. And then on our final platform, uh, Sensory Catalyst. Sensory Catalyst is a fancy way of saying we're going to be making yeast that will be used during anaerobic fermentation, um, meaning classic alcohol, carbon dioxide from sugars, um, shunting a little bit of that metabolism to make other molecules of interest. Um, and in this case, we're going to be focusing on flavor molecules. And we're going to um, demonstrate that with prototype. Um, hopefully with a new way to make uh, non-alcoholic and low alcoholic beers um, where we're going to effectively ferment all the flavor and fragrance that um, gets sort of washed out in the current ways that non-alcoholic beers are made. Again, going a little bit deeper in platform two, functional bioactives. Again, I'm gonna, we're gonna be uh, standing up doing precision, uh, precision fermented uh, molecules, specifically uh, beta acids and xanthohemol. Um, we're going to be dosing those into the uh, final package form and, um, you know, with the, with the intent to provide options for brewers uh, in particular uh, to not have to tunnel pasteurize. Tunnel pasteurization uses a lot of water and energy and also a lot of labor. Um, it also cooks the product and produces some off flavors when it's not done right. And so being able to use these natural ingredients that are already in the beer, but boosting them up using, using these precision fermented extracts is um, going to be a handy tool in the toolbox for brewers. One of the exciting things about this particular segment is that um, beta acids and xanthohemol in particular and the way hot producers are making these molecules today are that they are, um, they're using supercritical CO2 to extract the plant. Um, and these molecules, they're primarily focused on optimizing for alpha acids. Alpha, alpha acids are the um, bittering substance uh, that is used to make you know, that nice bitter flavor. And beta acids um, are really partitioned with some of the molecules that um, are typically not used um, in, uh, by brewers um, in any sort of form. Xanthohemol is only in present in about 1% by weight of the total hop cone, and it is actually quite a rare molecule. But we're estimating that there is an estimate, there is a market gap in the ability to supply uh, demand for these particular applica applications. And because Xanthohemol, um, they're, because they're both pretty rare molecules, we, we're estimating that the total addressable market of that supply gap is, is in the range of two and a half to six billion dollars. Now, I'm showing this slide on cannabinoids because um, one of the great things about being able to work with Ginkgo as our outsourced R&D synthetic biology providers is that you get to take advantage of the fact that they have worked on similar uh, projects with what we refer to as code base. And um, it just so happens that uh, we, uh, we meaning Ginkgo, um, 
did a project with a large uh, cannabis company uh, in Canada. Um, and we're able to focus on developing uh, a program where, where um, they're expressing cannabinoid uh, during yeast fermentations. And as it so happens, these genetic pathways are actually quite similar to the pathways that are required to make xanthohemol and uh, hot beta acid. So we'll have a bit of a head start uh, using uh, being able to leverage Ginkgo's experience in this simply because they've done something quite similar before. And that's a, that's a running thing throughout our platform, quite, quite frankly. I just wanted to bring this one up as an example. Okay, um, this is sort of a wrap up slide. I'm, I'm trying to leave as much time for questions as possible. Um, I'm happy to go back and uh, address the slides in the, um, in, in the Q&A section, um, but we're, our vision for the future of alcohol is one that's gonna use less ag agricultural inputs and utilities, produce less waste, fewer emissions, require less capital intensity, and perhaps less labor. Give more tools in the toolbox to you know, allow brewers and distillers and, and winemakers to uh, innovate. Um, and then really try to enable a lot of um, rising demand uh, in, in, the, in the area of uh, sustainability um, for consumers. So with that, I'm gonna open this up to questions. Awesome. Well, Russ, thank you for a really, really helpful and informative presentation. If you do have questions, um, you can type your questions in the Q&A box and I will answer them in the order that they're received. Please use the Q&A box as opposed to the comments section. It's just easier to manage all the questions in one, one section if you can. Um, Russ, I'm happy to kick things off here. So um, we'd be curious to know in your conversations with, with both large and small scale brewers out there, um, what are some like what are some like the low hanging fruit challenges that they see that would be a really good fit for precision fermentation in terms of whether those are whether that's flavor or something else you know there's there's going to be there's going to be things that are going to be opportunistic versus sort of visionary so what are the things that that brewers just go like man it'd be awesome if you could solve this problem for us well um, just so happens that that spent grain platform the, the spent grains solution uh, in our process biology platform um, is quite a problem uh, for most uh, small producers. Even for large producers, the best that they can get for that in terms of value is to have it hauled away uh, and used as cattle feed. And um, they only get about 60 bucks a metric ton for it. But by far, most of the producers in both distilleries and, and breweries, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an actual disposal cost. Yeah. Uh, and so if we're offering a solution that can um, take out the fiber and provide more, basically more yield in terms of alcohol uh, to blend back in or even make new products. Um, the feedback that I've been getting uh, has been pretty exciting. And in fact, um, I went ahead and developed, you know, I still have affiliation with the brewery I started uh, in about five years ago. A uh, small local brewery south of Boston, and we're actually using that as sort of our test kitchen. Uh, we used our this new process to actually create a prototype hard seltzer. And awesome! It, yeah, it turned out to be it's it's very exciting. It's a great product. Uh, we're getting a lot of focus group attention in our tap room. Very people are very excited about the story. Yeah. So it's a great example of meeting consumer demands and solving real problems. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I, I am curious, um, you know, brewing is a interesting brewing of, of all things, whether that's brewing, um, brewing wine, beer, um, not fermentation brewing, but brewing coffee, et cetera, like kind of specialty beverages um, have both. I have seen them both lean into technology and also lean into sort of the culture of craftsmanship and traditional traditional production. And I'm curious to know how you guys think about the consumer perception versus the brewer perception of what might be perceived as bio biotechnology being applied to um, industries that have been defined by craft and tradition um, and where you sort of see opportunities and any pushback. So, yeah, I, I totally agree. There is there is a large segment that uh, brewers or I'll call it alcoholic beverage producers that are, uh, fall back on tradition. Um, don't innovate. They're taught to do things, you know, in in, in particular ways, um, and want to stick to that. And it's part of the way they market their their product. Right. What we believe 
um, we're going to do is we're going to be pretty loud and proud about the fact that we're using GM technologies to enable the consumer benefit. So we're going to directly address throughout everything that we do how we're going to and you know respond to and 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 um, provide a narrative uh, for producers to address specific consumer benefits in primarily in the sustainability uh, space. And once we do that, I think a great example to go by is you know plant-based uh, protein uh, and plant-based meats like a la Impossible Foods. Um, even though it's sort of an indirect and there are no you know direct claims, uh, the the CEO there is you know very vocal about no cow, um, and you know it works for what they're doing, um, and it's received by the consumer as a as a huge positive. Um, but the thing that they really did was make a great product, and so by making a great product, addressing the consumer need, um, they almost create they created a, a, a whole new category, and I right. I, believe that's the playbook for, that we're going to use for, um, for Bruca. And then thinking about how you guys go to market, I've seen companies kind of take two different approaches here. I think the more traditional approach is to, is to say, we're going to partner with existing producers and we're going to help them sort of, you know, build the, these are all brewers who want to differentiate. Um, they want to solve problems like core fundamental problems to their business, um, open opportunities for new customers to join their brand story. Um, I'd say that's probably the more traditional approach we've seen. And I think a lot of what Ginkgo has done has been on the partnership side and partnering with companies and, and using technology to allow sort of these B2B relationships. I've also seen some companies take innovative strategies in terms of fully verticalization. So going from, you know, owning the technology, owning the brand, um, owning the means of production. One company that I've followed that's not an alcoholic company, but a company that is in the upcycled uh, universe, a company called the Tomo Coffee, um, which upcycles date waste in order to produce a coffee like beverage replacement um and they sort of own the messaging and technology around that brand and i think there are times in which companies see that as the advantageous approach because there's such a uniqueness to the story they need to control the messaging around it have you guys thought about both of those approaches and whether those are both things you would go after or what sort of the optimal optimal way you think about bringing technology like this to market we're holding that we're going to do a sort of a classic you know alpha beta tester approach coming primarily from uh craft you know craft segments yeah um, those are the folks who are more willing to innovate um they're problem solvers you know quite frankly big alcohol um, is really paid to you know not make mistakes and you know do repeatable things and yep. so they're really not wired when you get it outside of their innovation groups the the, the process folks the, the old brewmaster and the winemaker folks are um, you know, they're very wired to, you know, do the same thing every day, you know, in day in and day out. And so we want to work with those early innovators, um, create prototypes, example prototypes of the technology, get those out into limited market uh, through beta testers and, um, you know, help create the narrative that addresses the consumer uh, pull that's going to be required for uh, beverage industry. Gotcha. Yeah. I guess the last thing I would I would be curious to know more about is what you think will appeal to consumers the most in the end. So there's there's an opportunity to go after a sustainability story here. There's an opportunity to go after a flavor story here. Um, there's probably an opportunity to go after you know alcohol content, etc. I don't know if there's yeah. other other things. You have a lot of them. You have a lot of them listed here. Um, what do you think are be the most powerful most powerful tools in the end for people to say? This is an awesome product and I want to buy this. Uh, I think flavor is table stakes. You have to have great, you have to have great product. Um, in some cases you can innovate. I mean, uh, the hard seltzer category for 2014 is a great example of that, right? Yeah. Um, but um, I think flavor and quality are table stakes. Uh, yeah. What we're trying to do is say, we're going to use a new process uh, that's going to very directly address the need for uh, sustainable uh, technologies in the alcoholic beverage world that yeah. are demanding right now. Last question, Russ. Um, a, apart from anything fundraising oriented, are there any ways in which the audience can get in touch with you um, where you guys are looking for help, um, areas areas that you, you see opportunities, but perhaps could use some more connections? Yeah, I mean, we're, um, 
we're we're certainly starting to I'm starting to you know starting to go less into fundraising mode because I think we're getting close there. But really, I'm trying to now start to think about my uh, my alpha testers, my beta testers, the early innovators that are willing to uh, take a little bit of a chance on uh, the new technologies. Besides Barrel House Z, my my little brewery that I'm going to be doing most of the alpha testing with. Um, but, um, you know, we want to be in, in certain geographic markets. Um, and so I think the, the first task is, you know, craft distillers, craft brewers, and, and not, and I'm not limiting it to it. I just, my experience is, you know, that there'll be less testing going on with the big, with the big producers, but I am going to be looking for, you know, a lot of data testers and early adopters to the technology. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Well, Russ, we really, really appreciate your time. Um, it was really exciting to hear the story about brew coding. There's a lot, there's a huge amount of opportunity and optionality in, um, in what you and your company are building. Um, for anybody who was listening to this call today, um, we'd like to thank you for your participation, either listening now or on recording um, or via our newsletter. Um, for anybody who's new, uh, we host agri-food conversations every Thursday at 3 p.m. Central Time. If you want to share this with a friend, we welcome you to do so. A replay is going to be emailed to you in your, your inbox in the next 24 hours. And new viewers can register for agri-food conversations by going to agrifoodconversations.com. Um, if you'd like to learn more, join us next month as we're going to highlight companies working to make the food system more nutritious. Um, but Russ, um, thank you so much for your time today. And we'll see you all next week. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.